Hi, I'm Don Gray, and the program is Artist and Critic. Thanks for joining us. We're continuing our discussion of contemporary art, the difficulties that it's in, I, I think just absolutely uh, extreme difficulties in its, its, in its death throes. It has been for a n number of years. Perhaps it's, uh, it's already become mummified, and uh, the bones are showing pretty, pretty badly in it. But we're doing it through uh, comparing and contrasting it with art of the past to see just what we have lost in our contemporary art, how we failed to continue the thread of, of human experience and human expression. And we have too much, too much uh, gone toward the negative, nihilistic, destructive, cynical aspects of life uh, as if we weren't surrounded by them enough in the advertising media and many of the society's values anyway, corruption and so forth, that perhaps we don't need it in our art. We, we don't want an idealized art either, ignoring the problems. We don't want a sentimental, phony art, but we want an art that has some expressive power, something that captures some of the depth and vibrancy of the human spirit, some of the uh, broad spectrum of human possibilities rather than just totally eliminating it. We look at our first picture, and it was the uh, picture with which we ended our last program, a uh, painting of Mal Bab, a barroom habitué painted by Franz Hals in the 17th century. And we were discussing the character, the life, the vitality of this person, the reality of this person, certainly not one that the sophisticated art collector of today, to their detriment perhaps, would not invite to their latest cocktail gathering, discussing their latest acquisition, that beautiful red rectangle that's 10 feet square. But nonetheless, there is a, a legitimacy and a reality and a pungency about the woman. Perhaps part of the pungency comes from the fact that she hasn't bathed for quite a while, probably. But it also has to do with the reality and richness of her character. Now, let's, let's compare it to a 20th century work here, coming up. And a uh, painting by Rene Magritte, the surrealist called The Secret of Life, number four, painted in 1928. What a difference. What a difference. Here we have the epitome of 20th century coldness, depersonalization. Uh, we turn our back on the reality of life, so to speak. We go squirming and crawling into the uh, dank subterranean passages of our psyches, uh, e exploring uh, matters and 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 I was going to say feelings, but there isn't there isn't really much feeling in the picture in terms of human feeling, except the sense of of uh, a certain weird strangeness in the position, the repetition of the image. And obviously, if the man was facing the mirror, the reflection coming out would be the face. But we see another back, which again reemphasizes the, the depersonalization of our age. And we could say, well, look, isn't that a great painting? Because he's expressing some of the problems of our time. And um, my, my response would be that uh, it has a certain social value as a, as a document but that it is so overwhelmingly nihilistic and negative that it provides nothing upon which the human spirit can build to get itself out of this uh, cave of despond and uh, unfeeling that we find ourselves in. So uh, it just simply adds more impersonality and dehumanization to an already terribly uh, depersonalized scene. Now, you know, a painting like this reminds me of a statement by uh, Rodin, the uh, French sculptor of the late 19th, early 20th century. And uh, here's, here's a brief quote uh, from Rodin. It says, uh, I am one of the last witnesses of a dying art. The love which inspired it is spent. The wonders of the past are subsiding into limbo with nothing to take their place. And might well, and this situation might well be upon us very soon. He's discussing the French, of course, and he's talking uh, perhaps specifically about their destruction 
of the beautiful old architecture of, of the past and, and building it with what Rodin sees as a an contemporary ugly ugliness uh, uh, and a de-individualized kind of architecture. But it, it applies to our painting. It applies to our own time as much as it did to Rodin's. The French are hostile to the wealth of beauty which glorifies their race. Without anyone raising a finger to protect these treasures, they smite and smash them out of spite, ignorance and stupidity, or defile them on the pretext of restoring them. Don't reproach me for having said this before, he says. I would gladly repeat it over and over again for as long as the evil persists. How ashamed I am of my own time and how frightened by the future, what we're living in. He'd be just absolutely scared out of his mind. I wonder with horror how much responsibility for this crime rests with each individual. Am I not branded like the rest? See. Sensitive individuals, people who are not caught up in the trivial concerns of their time, but are striving for something that is universal and eternal. And uh, these are the great artists, these are the significant artists, as well as the significant thinkers of any times, the significant critics, the significant uh, playwrights, you know, whatever. Uh, those people who are not striving for this ultimate uh, reality, this continuation of the great thread of, of human concern, uh, are doomed to trivial negative expressions. They simply don't matter. It doesn't matter that they are, whether they're done or whether they aren't done. Let's go on to the next uh, picture. We see a uh, painting by Jan Vermeer, the uh, milkmaid done in the 17th century. And, 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 and look at the monumental monumentality of the, of the picture, the, the monumental solidity of the figure engaged in an everyday task in which the ordinariness of pouring the milk surrounded by the foods, the bread with the little sparkling crusts, diamond-like crusts as the light hit it, hits it, as the light hits the milk pouring from the spout. Vermeer has that rare ability to see the eternal, the eternally significant, the eternally meaningful in an everyday event. This takes true imagination. This is where genius can lie. Uh, tr imagination does not have to do with thinking up something just absolutely outlandish, something absolutely bizarre. Uh, that's not imagination. There are different kinds of imaginations. You know, the Abashian imagination deals with expressing some of the reality of, of the psychological uh, caverns of our being, uh, but there they are done with a certain amount of art, a certain amount of richness of conception. Uh, this kind of imagination deals with seeing the marvelous eternal verities in everyday objects. And it becomes a magnificent statement. This is why Vermeer endures to today and why Kelly won't, why Jack Beale won't, why I feel uh, Magritte won't. See. We go to our next uh, picture, and we see uh, a painting by the surrealist uh, Max Ernst called The Elephant Celebes, painted in 1921. And, you know, we aren't going to deny that there's a certain, in its own way, a surrealist imagination that one might say is akin to a Boschian imagination, uh, Hieronymus Bosch, Flemish uh, painter of the, what, 15th, 16th century. Uh, and one will not deny that there's a certain expressiveness of the demonic nature of our age, the horrendous uh, age of machine warfare and machine destruction of humanity. The elephant is like a tank or some kind of deep sea diving bell or in our own time, I mean you could see it as some sort of a killer satellite or, or anything, whatever your imagination will tell you, a warship, uh, an atom bomb itself. It's like what they call it, Big Boy, the first one they made, how to shape something like this, dropped on Hiroshima. It expresses some of the horror of our age, 
but it's sort of an unrelenting horror, an unrelieved horror, a, a, a total hopelessness, you know, the figure without the head in the foreground, the tree on the right, uh, tree-like form without limbs and so forth. It's cold, metallic. Uh, and, and we don't want to criticize too hard the artists of that time who were groping with trying to cope with psychologically and artistically the problems of the 20th century. And there's a certain legitimacy in it in terms of, of striving to express and relieve themselves of the horror of the 20th century. You know, as Freud says, as we were talking about in the last uh, program, rearranging reality so that it's bearable, that it eases our suffering, that kind of thing. But it is a, an overwhelmingly negative image. But if we grant a certain uh, acceptability and a certain reason for it, what possibly can be the acceptability of this piece that we'll look at right now, done in 1958, 37 years later by Peter Volkus, entitled Woman, dot, 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 Grass. And it's a, presumably it's metal or perhaps it's a ceramic piece, I think it's a ceramic uh, sculpture, so-called, and, and look at the shape. The shape obviously derived from Max Ernst's The Elephant Salibs, the same spirit. Um, uh, women libbers should really get up in arms over this piece. It demeans women. It says they're simply a bottom with a, a, a slit in it, you know, that is, is used for whatever purposes. And this is hardly your total woman. Here, this is not, uh, what's her name, it's selling total joy on television. Well, I can't think of her name. Marvell Martin or whatever, the blonde, uh, you know, greet your husband in a negligee kind of situation. And, of course, the body stops at the waist from which protrude these curving sort of pipes or, or spine or esophaguses, esophagi, which have been mechanized like nerve endings as if the top part had been ripped off and the connective tissue is sort of dangling and protruding. You know, we don't need this now. We didn't need it in 1958. It was difficult to bear in 1921, but the repetition of it and the nihilistic negativeness of it reflect the artistic poverty of the sculptor who, who does it, you know, who's unable to approach reality in an, a mature way, make a significant connection with reality. We go to our next piece. And it's a self-portrait by Oskar Kokoschka, the 20th century expressionist, uh, Austrian expressionist, painted in 1913. Now, we, we don't have to paint things smoothly. We don't have to become over-concerned with a sharp contour. Um, in the self-portrait, he, re he recognizes and expresses for us something of the fact, what is my destiny, say, by pointing at himself? What, what can I do? What will I be? Where will I go? How can I survive? How can I fulfill myself? See, all of these things that are also represented in a very human image. See, we can identify with an image of this sort in terms of the, the crusty paint that suggests flesh, uh, that suggests form, the expression in the eyes that are wide open and saying, you know, my God, what's going to come next? This kind of thing. Where the coldness of execution, say, in the Magritte, um, the secret of life uh, alienates us. It pushes us away because it is dehumanized. We need humanity. We need warmth because we are warm human beings. When we become cold and depersonalized, we have lost much of our humanity. See? And many of the contemporary artists have lost that, have lost that sense of humanity. We, we go to the next uh, picture, which is a self-portrait, again by Kokoschka, this one in 1970. Again, he's pointing at his breast. And one wonders uh, about uh, prescience or premonition in pictures like this, because during the First World War, he will be bayoneted in the chest. He will lie for two or three days on the field of battle. He's fighting for the German army, army of course. And uh, one sees him already as a victim of the period. The storm clouds of the period are in back in the gray, the frazzled stroking quality of the coat, of the hands, less so of the face, 
the dislocation of the jaw, the mouth slings to the right, the, the look in the eye that says again as it did in the first place, although with a little bit more of a deadened quality after he's been through it a little bit and he says, you know, my God, am I going to make it? Is the world going to make it? This kind of thing. And I don't know exactly when he was wounded in the First World War. You know, this is 1917, it ends in 1918. But it was such a serious wound that he didn't paint for uh, a year or two or three after it happened. So I suspect that it, the wound has yet to come, see, because this is painted with a great deal of virility and energy. So keep, keep the energy, keep the feeling of this in mind as we go to our next picture a painting by the contemporary Philip Perlstein. You know, we were looking at the hands of Oscar Kokoschka. We look at the detail of the hands in uh, Perlstein's female model here, uh, done just a few years ago. And there's a certain coldness in the work of Perlstein, a certain uh, inhumanity <laughs> in the almost mechanical delineation of the fingers. There's a certain, if the slide we're looking at is accurate, there's a certain uh, brilliance in the red of the color and there's a certain yellowishness in the hands. I don't know whether that's true or not. That gives it a certain power, but many of uh, Perlstein's pictures are so icily delineated that uh, they are tie in directly with Magritte and Ellsworth Kelly and all of the cold, depersonalized uh, geometric painters of the period. But let's see the whole picture here. We'll go to the next one. And it, it's, it's the whole picture. And the full title is Female Model in Red Robe on Wrought Iron Bench. And there's something about the prosaic, descriptive quality, banality of the title that suggests some of the meticulous concern for what shall we say, detailing reality without capturing the soul of the reality. There's a certain coldness about these pictures that there wasn't, that there, that was lacking that in the, say for example, the painting of the milk made by Vermeer where there was a certain sense of warmth and humanity. See, there's a, there's a coldness about this. And you know, there's nothing wrong with chopping the head off of a figure for design effect or, you know, what have you, to emphasize body, but it does cut down on the hum humanity of the figure, see, to take away the head. And this ties in with the whole feeling of the piece, the whole execution of it. We go to our next one. We see another contemporary artist, a woman by the name of Catherine Murphy, self-portrait in pink nightgown, painted in 1970. <clears throat> Excuse me. Suffering like a cold, with a cold just like the rest of you. Uh, it's fairly precisely delineated, and the technique uh, is a has a certain detachment about it, but perhaps it's saved from being as, as coldly formal as Pearlstein's is by the, scent, by the feeling of the woman. You know, I mean, at least she has a certain sense of the intensity of the creative moment. She's not trying to present herself uh, in any way but what she was at that moment, you know, kind of sloppily, or even slovenly dressed, if she'll excuse me saying so, in her nightgown and uh, a short robe and, and kind of a sagging uh, posture. But, you know, there's a certain feeling of reality about that. So, uh, we go to the next picture. And a Paul Cezanne portrait uh, painted 1885 or so, self-portrait, that has a, a sort of a similar feeling to it, a certain geometric quality to it, a certain, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, weariness in Cezanne, a certain, as if he's just mentally, physically, and psychically exhausted, you know, the expression in the face, the eyes seem sort of squinty in the face, just seems uh, kind of eroded and, and, and blanched and weasoned and so forth, geometric emphasis with the palette in the corner, emphasizing the corner. Uh, see, if our art, our art can be controlled, see. Our art can have a contour as opposed to an expressionist roughness as was in Kokoschka. I'm not trying to sell either one uh, technical point of view because that's all it is, is a technical point of view. You can be emotional with a, a hard contour as you can with a 
a loose one, you know, which many people don't realize. Expressionists seem to think that feeling can only come uh, from rough paint, which is uh, uh, not true, of course. We, we go to our, our next portrait, and it happens to be another self-portrait by Cezanne, a totally different mood. There's a sort of a benign quality about it, a certain, almost for Cezanne, a certain light-hearted <laughs> acceptance of things. Cezanne was far from being a light-hearted individual. But the point is that he's expressing individual variation within the control of his style you know, at this period, using the contour fairly succinctly and fairly clearly, fairly faithfully, building his forms through the modulation of planes and so forth. But there's a humanity here. There's a sense of an artwork, uh, a solidly structured head modeled fully integrated within the structure of the painting as suggested by the building up of the coat as a form, the breakup of the space in the background with the diamonds that ease in their strength and darkness as they go toward the head so as not to imprison the head in a vice, you know, that kind of thing. But one has a sense of total artistic structure and the significant significance of the form of the head and of the personality of the person in the work. See, th then we go to our next piece. Perhaps we've seen it before, I mean, I'm sure we've seen it before in the original, probably these huge over life size heads of Chuck Close. I uh, may have discussed it on another program. Uh, these are painted from photographs. And they are not artworks in the sense of being integrated forms, of being forms as the head as a form itself, and as a form integrated within the structure of the painting as a whole. It, it, it's structuralist. It's loose. It's flabby. It relates to the, the layout of a photograph and the handling of form in a photograph and has nothing to do with painting. So that this becomes another one of the contemporary fallacies that you work from a photograph, you're working from reality. And it just simply is not so. And there's an impersonality to it, an impersonal quality in the minuteness of the technique as it responds to the detailed variations of the photograph. We can say, obviously, there's a certain expression of a personality, sort of a, uh, a tough, kind of detached, cold-blooded quality in the character. Many of the modern artists and people associated with contemporary art have this cold-blooded, kind of cynical, detached quality, and that's why their art is that way. See, it directly expresses their personalities and their feelings about life. To, to create a rich artwork, one of significance, you have to have a little bit of richness in yourself, see, a little bit of depth and feeling in yourself. See, perhaps at this point we could uh, go toward uh, a text, go toward a, a book, go toward a thought. Um, Maybe the one who expresses it in a rather beautiful way is, is that of Carl Jung, the, uh, the, the great psychologist and uh, delver into the meaning of life and delve, delver into the psychology of humanity. He is, in his uh, essay entitled The Spiritual Problem of Modern Man, which I recommend that all read, to gain a certain insight into themselves, he's talking about what the modern man truly is or truly should be. And he's saying that uh, there are many pseudo-moderns, there are many false moderns in our time, but the truly modern man has a fully developed consciousness, a consciousness that is not simply dealing with rationality or rational perception of the world, but is, 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 is broad in depth and, and breadth and, and truly sees the world, truly understands the world. He says that there are, most, there are very few of these people alive today. You know, he wrote it in 28, but obviously it's as true then, today as it is then. He says that many people are still living at a primitive level, say, and many of the most enlightened people, a primitive psychological level, and many of the uh, advanced people, you know, many of our educators and so forth, are living at the a more advanced stage, say, of four or five hundred years ago. See, the Renaissance. He's saying that there's a, a modern consciousness here. Uh, okay, so what he says, he says, um, 
this sounds so grand, this sense of, of of, of understanding in the modern man that it borders suspiciously on bathos. For nothing is easier than to affect a consciousness of the present, to pretend to be aware of the present. A great horde of worthless people do in fact give themselves a deceptive air of modernity by skipping the various stages of development and the tax tasks of life they represent. Say, I mean, the, this is the pseudo-modern artist who says, well, let me see what gimmick can I come up with that will capture the attention of the art crowd. Suddenly, these pseudo-moderns appear by the side of the truly modern man. Uprooted wraiths, blood-sucking ghosts whose emptiness casts discredit upon him, the truly modern man, in his unenviable loneliness. See? I mean, it's lonely to think differently from the rest of the world. Thus it is that the few present day men are seen by the undiscerning eyes of the masses only through the dismal veil of those specters, the pseudo-moderns, and are confused with them. It cannot be helped. The modern man is questionable and suspect, and has been so at all times, beginning with Socrates and Jesus. When new ideas, a man or a woman, truly sees and understands the breadth of contemporary life, and continuing here, skipping a paragraph, I know that the idea of proficiency is especially repugnant to the pseudo-moderns because it reminds them unpleasantly of their trickery. Say, this, however, should not prevent us from taking it as our criterion of modern man. We are even forced to do so, for unless he is proficient, the man who claims to be modern is nothing but a trickster. Doesn't this sound familiar with many of our modern artists who drip their paint, who use paint rollers, who spatter, who write up a little conceptual treatise of what art is, you know, rather than having to really do it, see? The modern man must be proficient in the highest degree, for unless he can atone by creative ability for his break with tradition, he is merely disloyal to the past how true that is in relation to contemporary art. To deny the past for the sake, uh, I'm sorry, to deny the past for the sake of being conscious only of the present would be sheer futility. Today has meaning only if it stands between yesterday and tomorrow. It is a process of transition that forms the link between the past and future. Only the man who is conscious of the present in this sense can call himself modern. The so-called modern artists have severed their link with the past, are l existing in isolation. They're not truly modern. Their art is not alive. It's without feeling. It's without the juice of the sense of the continuity of life. We'll continue these thoughts in succeeding programs. This has been Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gray. Thanks for being with me.